Uh, yeah, it's a real honor, um, and uh, I'm uh, amazed <laughs> about uh, the amount uh, of people that um, uh, showed up. Uh, I'm really honored uh, to present my work here. Uh, the uh, evening uh, will consist in uh, two parts. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the broader context of uh, what we're doing uh, at the Institute of Network Cultures. And then, as Peter uh, announced, I will then um, say something about my upcoming book. And um, I will read some parts from um, the Sad by Design uh, chapter. And then we can uh, uh, discuss, uh, discuss matters after, after that. Okay. Um, well, maybe you know uh, that we have this very small... A research unit in an applied science polytechnic uh, school in Amsterdam uh, since 15 years now. Uh, that's quite a long time. Um, of course it has its ups and downs with the funding and uh, yeah I mean we're not very many we're three or four people maybe um, and there's a lot of international visitors and um, uh, interns all this um, and I'm going to give a brief um, overview of what we're doing right now. Uh, of course, it also invite you to uh, participate because uh, after all, we're the Institute of Network Cultures and we, what we do is uh, we build the uh, networks um, and uh, we would uh, very much uh, like to invite you to uh, participate uh, and uh, work with us if you, if you like. Okay, so this is networkcultures.org. Uh, um, one of the oldest networks, which uh, played an important role also uh, because uh, it was uh, hosting uh, events here in Croatia twice, once in Split and uh, once here in Zagreb, is the Video Vortex Network. Uh, this is the last event in the south of India last year. And... Um, <clears throat> Video Vortex deals with uh, the question of the politics and aesthetics of online video. Uh, still emerging topics, strangely enough. YouTube was founded in 2005. The network started in 2006. Maybe there is a legacy indeed of tactical media and uh, video art. Uh, you know, what is video art in the age of YouTube? That's the simple, that's the simple question. Uh, not so easy to answer. Uh, so, um, yeah, we're still dealing with this uh, phenomena. Uh, although, you know, everybody's watching YouTube, uh, it doesn't really mean that um, from, let's say, a perspective of research or thinking, critical thinking, uh, a lot is happening. I just want to remind you uh, of what happened, uh, uh, you know, 10 uh, days ago in Christchurch, New Zealand. That was uh, online video, right? Uh, the guy uh, was uh, streaming uh, his uh, uh, murder rampage live on Facebook Live, right? So this is, uh, this is an example uh, of, uh, of online video. Uh, uh, a culture uh, that uh, is alive today, right? This is uh, online video. And um, it is really surprising that so few people uh, are dealing with it uh, as of yet. Although, you know, it's our oldest network, it's still surviving. In, May, in my September, we have a next uh, uh, gathering that's going to look very good uh, in Malta. Um, so again, we uh, we do one uh, here in Europe and then uh, hopefully after that also again uh, in Amsterdam um, because we think that uh, you know the the role of the moving image in the internet culture is on the rise it's just becoming more and more important wherever you look uh, whatsapp Instagram uh, uh, as I said already Facebook uh, um, everywhere you look there is a there is a moving image uh, and even streaming uh, aspect to it okay so this really needs our full attention um, another topic that uh, we deal with uh, uh, not so successfully but uh, we think it's still important is the whole question of the architecture of search engines it's somewhat unpopular today um, 
uh, almost forgotten although I bet that everyone here in the room has today used the search engine uh, uh, the critical thinking about search uh, is, uh, is uh, really approaching zero um, there is just almost no uh, organized thinking happening uh, around this topic believe it or not uh, it's really surprising uh, almost impossible to find money for, right? Even also on European level, uh, nobody is interested in search, right? And again, you know, you see a similar tap pattern. Everybody is using YouTube, but yeah, uh, or everybody is using uh, search engines. But the the, the kind of structured uh, thinking about it, its impact, uh, the the political choices. Okay, well maybe we can rephrase it, and then we can maybe do a, use a sexy word and and speak about the politics of algorithms. Maybe that you know <laughs> might appeal to some. Uh, but okay, uh, we don't do that. We want to talk uh, straight business. And uh, uh, again, here another other case um, which is a highly unpopular uh, critical research into Wikipedia uh, uh, Wikipedia uh, you know uh, again very very likely that almost everyone uh, of you at least uh, today or this week has looked at Wikipedia maybe not directly or indirectly right maybe you haven't gone to a page directly but at least you saw uh, the summary, you remember the summary there huh? <coughs> on the right corner. Uh, Wikipedia uh, is the biggest, uh, uh, still the biggest non profit uh, internet initiative, um, and it's not going, doing very well. Uh, participation is going down, uh, pages are not getting updated. We all know the story. There's a huge gender problem with uh, Wikipedia. Uh, ma mainly the, the so-called white male geeks who are, are still running it. Nothing has changed. So yeah, there is a there is a crisis with Wikipedia. But you know who is addressing it? We all use it, but we're not really uh, dealing uh, with it. This is not quite the case, of course, with uh, the hot topic uh, of uh, the social media. Um, in our context, we have been dealing with it uh, on a structural level since 2011, the year of uh, Arab Spring and Occupy and so on and on, the movement of the squares. Uh, it's an initiative that's still active. It's called Unlike Us. Uh, it looks at um, the, the question of, okay, you're bored with Facebook, you don't like this and this and that, but you know how should our uh, alternatives look like? Uh, and this is also a question I know Mama has been dealing with, and uh, you know this is really uh, very much on uh, on our minds. Uh, uh, but um, to be honest, uh, we have uh, at least until uh, let's say the the moment uh, of uh, Cambridge Analytica, or if you like, okay, the rise of uh, Brexit, Trump, etc. Since 2016, 17, 18, uh, we uh, we do see that there is some movement happening in this field. There's no structured uh, uh, support or any initiatives, but there are uh, more an, uh, alternatives. Uh, and that in itself is a good thing. And there are more people who are becoming aware that you can just uh, you know deinstall the Google search engine and use DuckDuckGo. You can forget WhatsApp and go on Telegram or Signal. You can uh, uh, forget uh, Gmail and go to Proton Mail, and so on and so on. Right? Uh, I mean, there is a list, uh, but uh, yeah, where are we? Um, this is uh, another initiative that we've been focusing on for a number of years. In the let's say the what we could call the post uh, uh, Snowden years uh, after 2013 when uh, the general uh, awareness about uh, privacy and surveillance uh, really uh, went uh, on the rise right so there, there is there's no doubt that more and more people also ordinary users they are becoming aware that there's something happening uh, whether they do something about it is, is something else. But, of course, the, if people think about, okay, 
uh, internet and uh, trouble or uh, you know it's maybe something wrong they usually end up uh, with this topic right they usually end up thinking about privacy related issues and surveillance okay so this and this is what we could almost nowadays call you know a kind of mainstream internet critique right it in nine out of ten cases it is related to privacy and surveillance maybe for the for the right reason i don't know but uh okay so uh for us also for that reason uh it is not uh, our highest uh, priority because there's so many other things that um need to be dealt with need to be addressed another one in our context of course we are here uh, also in the, in the context of uh, arts and culture um, is of course the rise of the creative industries uh, now the dominant ideology in uh, the netherlands where i come from right especially after heavy um, uh, budget cuts um, uh, everyone says well culture you, you should not uh, subsidize it anymore forget about it uh, the artists uh, should uh, you know make the make a living themselves they shouldn't by now know how how to do that right well we know that's not the case but uh, this is the uh, this is the ideology uh, in the year 2011 uh, the uh, the government of um, our Premier uh, Rutte, he cut uh, the cultural budget uh, by 50% in one go, right? 50%. Uh, and the cultural scene uh, in the Netherlands has since then, of course, never uh, recovered uh, from that, uh, especially in our fields, the smaller um, initiatives, uh, also many of them dealing with uh, new media, but not only that, um, uh, the smaller uh, initiatives uh, were uh, cut heavily and uh, many of them disappeared. Okay, uh, theater uh, was the one that was hit uh, hardest uh, and is also the, the, the one that is, um, let's say, most difficult to deal with when you're talking about creative industries like uh, you know to expect independent theater to be fully self-funded is uh, is uh, almost uh, impossible in in part of also because of that reason in 2013 we started uh, the money lab initiative and money lab is still the, now the most uh, active uh, network uh, so we just a couple of weeks ago had a, a meeting in the uh, in, first one in Germany, before that uh, in the United States, and in, uh, we had one in London, and of course uh, in Amsterdam. Money Lab asked the question, how artists are going to make a living in the 21st century? And uh, relates that to the merger of computer networks with payment systems. Uh, think of uh, something like blockchain, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, but also think of more traditional things like uh, uh, crowdfunding campaigns uh, or even on the technical terms, you know, the slow move uh, with uh, mobile payment uh, apps on your, on your smartphone, right? These are all... Uh, uh, signals or signs that uh, that we are integrating let's say the computer networks with the payments in the past that was not the case um, and the question is uh, you know how are we going to uh, look at that and um, um, if there is no funding for art anymore how are we going to make uh, a living right and this is a question or some people say well the artists will never make uh, a living uh, and then they end up uh, in a, a kind of a universal basic income uh, corner um, and because uh, of course you know, a universal basic income uh, is one of the many uh, let's say routes to get there because we know uh, there's not going to be work anymore for every one of us and so it becomes a, a politics let's say of the redistribution of wealth Right? And how are we going to do that? And what are the, the roles of computer networks and our definition of money uh, related to that? Okay, so Money Lab uh, deals with this question of uh, what happens when the very definition of money uh, becomes up for grabs, right? Money is no longer just defined by the national bank and money is floating around everywhere. Uh, there's new forms of money 
right? Okay. So this is a, an expanding universe, let's say, maybe a very similar to uh, the Internet uh, uh, universe that was expanding in uh, the mid or late 90s. Um, and we are trying hard, together with Axioma in Ljubljana, uh, to uh, organize the first uh, money lab uh, for this region, um, very likely to happen uh, in March. So in March 2020, uh, we're going to do uh, the next money lab, on May, not the next one, but uh, so number eight. Uh, number eight will be uh, hopefully uh, happening uh, well, not here in Zagreb, but in Ljubljana. Okay, so uh, so this is Money Lab. For all these networks, you know, you can uh, uh, you can become part of it. Uh, there's gatherings, workshops, online gatherings, uh, lists, uh, stuff happening on social media, and so on. All of them are easy to find. And a new topic that we are both are also dealing with is uh, is this kind of the, a bit broader question of uh, the politics of the online self, and that maybe comes now uh, closer to uh, to the topic of my book. Um, so this yeah yeah it deals with uh, yeah the selfie and uh, the 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 politics of uh, how uh, how we. Uh, uh, organize and maintain our um, self-representation, um, some call it self-promotion, um, uh, and how, <clears throat> how this is uh, playing out uh, uh, in, in the uh, network uh, architectures. And we think this is an, uh, a very important uh, issue. Uh, in part, there's also the, the um, um, the aspect of uh, the um, uh, you know anonymity, uh, because the uh, a topic in my book that I deal with is also not just the selfie, because the other the other side the other side of the coin of the selfie is what we call mask design. Huh? So how can you how can you protect yourself, or how can you right? Um, how can you maintain a certain dignity of, uh, of your uh, private life and how do we collectively uh, design uh, those masks, right? And you could say that the selfie, the so-called self, is one of the many masks uh, that, uh, that we have, right? Okay. Uh, then uh, for all these uh, activities, uh, what we do is, uh, and a lot of people know about that, uh, and that's how they get to know us, is that we uh, or organize publications in very many different um, um, ways. Um, and we have been focusing for, and in fact from the day, the day that we started, on uh, the question of how uh, how we want uh, our digital publications uh, look like, and there are different, um, you know, initiatives. This was uh, one publishing lab. Now we have an, a new one uh, that is running at the moment. It's called uh, Make, Making Public, and uh, there is there is a, if you're interested, uh, there's a big art publishing gathering uh, mid-May in the Netherlands. Uh, we organized that in, uh, and it's on the website on 16 and 17 uh, of May. A lot of people come together to discuss these uh, publishing and art uh, strategies, the, the way we use uh, new platforms and uh, technologies. Okay. Um, here, uh, this is kind of uh, talking about methods. Uh, you know, this is, uh, this is maybe how uh, we could summarize what we do, uh, how we build those networks around those topics, let's say uh, digital money or uh, social media critique, and then we organize workshops, events, conferences and stuff, and publications. Okay, so very, uh, very basic uh, scheme. I don't like method, uh, but okay. So. Um, this is uh, maybe our um, our approach. Okay, so here you see some of my uh, my own uh, stuff that I've been uh, um, uh, dealing with and uh, publishing. This is Networks Without a Cause. This is a book from uh, 2012. Um, 
which was uh, kind of when when the the web 2.0 came to an end and we really uh, started to um, live and realize that we were in the age of the social media right and uh, um, and that the the, the term social networking was kind of fading away and this, the term social media the one we still use uh, uh, became uh, the dominant uh, one um, yeah I don't write real books uh, I just bring together uh, my my writings because I'm uh, uh, coming from the European uh, essay uh, tradition so I really like the essay of course uh, they are concise for the for the simple reason that my topic is quite narrow as you know almost nobody is using the internet so it's a really narrow topic <laughs> uh, almost nobody is dealing with it systematically uh, uh, we always make the joke that you when you go to Europe you cannot study the internet anywhere right you cannot you can study film yes and theater uh, uh, literature but you cannot study the internet right it's been like that for the last 25 years and uh, yeah I don't know if that's uh, really gonna gonna change anytime soon but yeah so that's the reality of my non-existing uh, uh, discipline uh, and uh, um, yeah, so the, and I, I myself, I am also quite, let's say, uh, fragmented. I'm trying to deal with a lot of uh, uh, different aspects of this uh, still emerging uh, critical internet cultures. Okay, here you see uh, uh, a more recent one. It's called uh, Social Media Abyss. And um, there, uh, of course, this is uh, 2016, so this is really at the height, let's say, of the, of the hegemony of uh, Facebook uh, and uh, Google, when they were at their, and their, at their most powerful. Um, and, um, yeah, I really like, for instance, that first essay, what's the social in social media? This is a, a question that still occupies me uh, uh, a lot, and I really like, uh, uh, it always reminds me that uh, when, when I was studying that I, I was really interested in sociology, and um, yeah, I, want, I still want to make that bridge between sociology and social media. I know it sounds uh, very unlikely. I have to still meet the first sociologist who d deals with uh, the social in social media. Uh, these are two uh, entities that are really, really quite uh, distant uh, from each other, very unfortunately. Uh, but I think it's, uh, it's really uh, important to understand uh, you know what I call the the, the collapse uh, between um, you know the social in social media and society, right? For many many people, there is no society anymore uh, other than uh, how they deal with others uh, through social media, right? Um, however, uh, we still have to uh, catch up with that. So the theory, the theorization, uh, is uh, very, very much behind. So it's very ironic, in a way, that society is so much further uh, than the thinking. Uh, um, but this is uh, this is the fact, and um, uh, and I think we are also paying a high price uh, for that, uh, for this uh, uh, growing gap. Okay, here you see my uh, my upcoming book. Um, this uh, this time uh, not with Polity Press. They were not interested. Uh, 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 so I uh, I worked with uh, Pluto Press, and um, uh, simultaneously uh, it comes out in Italian, in um, Spanish, and in German. And here you see the um, uh, the table of content, um, and. Uh, yeah, society of the social uh, is uh, is the introduction. That's what I uh, try to uh, explain. Maybe you know that in Italian the, they speak about social. Are you on social? That's a, no, a normal uh, question in Italian. Uh, it means uh, are you on Facebook? Huh? Uh, are you on social? Huh? And I was really intrigued by that uh, by that uh, remark. Huh? Uh, so, uh, society of the social, as it sounds like a complete uh, contradiction or pleonasm, whatever you want to, uh, but the oddness of the phrase uh, 
also should uh, you know so sh somehow be uh, a wake up call in the same way as the social media as ideology is an essay um, which is really dealing with the question a very kind of classic almost Al Althusserian question uh, what happens when um, you know in, the, in this idea idea of him uh, from the early 70s of the ideological state apparatuses maybe uh, neo marxists uh, in the uh, audience will uh, maybe maybe vaguely remember uh, this uh, this term uh, so i asked the question what happens when uh, you know uh, the social media uh, become kind of the, this kind of uh, hegemonic apparatus and also, uh, kind of, uh, in the way Zizek always also talks about uh, ideology in the sense that it's, you know, it's always present, it's there, but you don't feel it, you don't see it, you live it, right? So, and that's precisely our social media uh, condition. Um, also, uh, I in the, have an essay here, uh, which is a more theoretical, which deals with uh, the kind of the three terms that in my own work play an, an important role and how they relate maybe chronologically but mm, I don't want to think about them too much so the media and the media theory or the tactical media for that matter right then the network uh, the network of course in my own institute and the way we have tried to further think and, and make networks and then our daily reality of today, 20, 30 years later, of the platform. And we are now in the age of platform capitalism, and what does that mean? Especially also how that platform relates to the two previous modes. Uh, because obviously the platform incorporates the media and the networks, right? So it, it kind of sucks them up and uh, brings them up to an almost a higher level, almost a Hegelian uh, synthesis uh, level, uh, in, in, in a similar way as uh, the internet was once thought of a network of networks. Uh, so a network that brings together a lot of different networks. Well, that's precisely what the platform is doing today. Uh, the platform brings together a lot of um, uh, media. Uh, think of uh, news. Uh, uh, think of uh, of uh, video. Uh, think of the the news feed and so on and so on, or Twitter for that matter. And then uh, and then uh, the networks uh, as well. Meaning the social relationships and then bringing them together and then uh, monetizing them uh, because uh, that's what in the end uh, the platform uh, is is doing okay before I uh, start with the um, uh, the sad by design story uh, there's this one uh, book that you know is important for me because uh, this is a collaboration between me and Ned Rossiter uh, from Sydney, and here uh, we, we've over the, over almost a decade we've been thinking about uh, this term called organized networks. Uh, organized networks is a very simple answer uh, to the exploitation of the weak links. That is the the, the basic way in which Facebook and Google and all the rest have built up their empires uh, by sucking out your uh, your um, your address books. Uh? You remember, you import them all, uh, you give them all away uh, uh, to them. That's the, the requirement of them uh, before you can even start uh, becoming active uh, on the network. Weak links as a very very undefined relation between f the friends of the friends of the friends eh? remember eh? uh, so weak links are the you, you kind of know the people but not really anymore vaguely you know their name no maybe would you know how they are you are connected to them mm, maybe you can still re reconstruct that right and these are the, the kind of third degree of weak links and the whole social media is based uh, on that 
right? Because otherwise you would have only what we call strong links. Uh, your actual network consists of how many? 10, 40, 100 people at most uh, that you really know, that you work with, that you communicate with, right? But uh, you, we know every 13-year-old starts with 500 plus friends. How is that possible, right? Uh, uh, they start, they start at the age of 13, they start with 500 plus. Right? Now, how, how, how is that? Um, and if we want to rethink uh, the networks, uh, this is one of the very, very basic things in rebuilding it that we need to uh, you know, uh, approach in a different way, in a better way. And this is the, the term we developed for that is organized networks. Um, okay, organized network sounds a little bit like mafia or, um, yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, it's organized crime, right? <laughs> you remember that one? Um, <clears throat> but, um, yeah, but also in the, in the Adilno years, the Agen to Bilvet years, we, uh, we wrote about uh, organized innocence, uh, for instance, uh, which is another uh, maybe more Asian way of looking at things. Uh, the phenomena of organized innocence you can find uh, everywhere in Asia where people kind of, uh, you know, have a very clear psychic armor uh, to defend themselves against society and, to, uh, um, and we call that uh, organized innocence. However, uh, the organized networks uh, concept is very much uh, one which is easy to translate for all of us. There's a lot of software available for that. And, uh, you know, so in that sense, um, it is not so uh, utopian or dystopian for that matter. It's much closer, let's say, to uh, the idea of, uh, of, the, uh, of the social, um, of the tactical media of the 90s, uh, an, uh, an approach. Um, yep. Okay. Now I have to switch. <coughs> Just wait a moment. Yep. Here we are. The computer is slow. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, sorry about that. Here we are. Now, please come. The computer is almost dying. <laughs> um, I just have to be patient. Um, I'm going to uh, read um, here the, uh, the part about uh, Sad by Design. Um, this is a, a follow-up essay um, which uh, I wrote, uh, let's say, um, maybe uh, in the summer uh, last year. And um, before that, I had uh, written another one, which is uh, also in the, in the book, uh, which is somewhat similar um, and uh, published uh, earlier, also uh, on um, on Eurozine. And um, that one was dealing with it's called um, um, uh, disc uh, the discontents of the distraction. Uh, so, the distraction and its uh, discontents, uh, a reference to the uh, essay by, uh, by Freud. And in that, in that um, essay, I, I, tried, uh, I tried for the first time to really uh, change the tables. So, I asked myself not like, okay, how can I criticize the, um, uh, the existing um, social media? Uh, I asked myself, um, how 
how can I, uh, let's say, really change uh, sides and work towards uh, some kind of a, a radical empathy uh, with ordinary users that are trapped uh, in, in the social media uh, monopoly, uh, in the, what, what the, uh, you know, some people call uh, the kind of the, the cage um, where, where, where people really find that there is no, no way out, right? There is no way um, uh, for them to... Um, I think it's really stuck, so I'm very sorry, but um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I will need to uh, restart it because it's just too too heavy uh, uh, but it doesn't matter because uh, I'm, I'm just going to read uh, a text so um, um, and the computer will uh, will be with us in, in a moment so uh, um, so in this uh, in this essay about distraction I uh, I for the first time looked at uh, I, I really tried to uh, become part of uh, uh, of the of the millions and billions who are uh, on the social media and really don't know um, how to uh, how to get out. And um, I did not want to uh, offer some kind of offline uh, European kind of uh, romantic uh, notion that you can uh, just put it aside, that you can go and uh, walk in the park and go to the forest and, uh, you know, some kind of, uh, this kind of offline romanticism, you know that, right? Uh, yeah, this, uh, I, I felt that this was not really uh, an option. Um, I had made a, a TV program about it for Dutch uh, television, um, and I, I worked with that. And th there, I saw that um, the the offline, uh, um, um, let's say, momentum uh, is is really only something for the very rich, where you kind of outsource your presence on the net to others, right? Where you, where if you have money, you you kind of go to a, a hotel that uh, protects itself against uh, all Wi-Fi signals. Uh, th this doesn't make any sense, and especially for young people, this is really uh, not the way to go. So, um, so that, of course, then uh, really asks um, uh, a lot from, let's say, the the position of the critic. Or the, or the position of the artists and uh, the activists, which for me uh, are three positions that are very close and th that deal with different aspects. However, uh, they are uh, an, uh, essentially one, one and the same, or at least, at least uh, they struggle with the same uh, questions. Uh, so yes, we uh, we work on alternatives. Yes, we uh, we criticize platform capitalism. Yes, uh, we advise not to use Facebook and Google. However, after uh, ten years uh, doing uh, this uh, this work, or in my case, maybe even even longer, uh, it's also very very good to ask the, the question. You know what what is the real existing uh, social uh, media reality. Huh? So, uh, and um, why should we, um, as critics, uh, remove ourselves from that? Yeah? Maybe it's a it's this kind of a similar moment as the cultural studies went through in Britain in, uh, let's say, the early mid 70s. Right? It's that kind of that kind of a moment um, where. Um, where this, uh, where this, this uh, feel that you have, like, okay, we need to, uh, we need to connect. We need to connect. We need to be on the side of young people uh, that uh, that uh, struggle with this, right? And also, we need not to medicalize the other, right? You are not sick. You are not sick. Right. This is a very, very important. So, uh, from the position of the of, of the critic, uh, uh, so uh, yes, there is there is addiction. Yes, we go back uh, uh, to these uh, social media uh, time uh, and uh, and and uh, again. But um, 
Yeah, so I'll see if uh, I can bring it back on again. Might take some time, but okay, doesn't matter. Uh, so yeah, so this uh, kind of, uh, and again there, um, uh, maybe under influence also of Susan Sontag, uh, uh, it's in the metaphor, the whole, qu the whole question of uh, how to deal with, uh, with that is, uh, is, an, is an important uh, uh, moment uh, for me. Uh, so I don't want to uh, medicalize uh, the, uh, the millions, if not billions of people uh, on, uh, on the internet, right? This is not uh, the, way, the way to go. So, uh, now I'm going to um, read uh, from the text, and um, it's called Sad by Design. Try and dream, if you can, of a morning app. The mobile has become uh, dangerously close to our psychic bone, to the point where the two can no longer be separate. If only my phone could gently weep. McLuhan's extension of man has imploded right into the exhausted self. Social media and psyche have fused, turning um, daily life into a social reality. And so I'm using here the Italian uh, way, yeah? Social reality yeah? is the reality of the social or the reality of the social media, but I like the term. I like the term social reality because of obviously uh, uh, it, is a, it is a reference uh, to um, the um, uh, yeah, social, uh, social media and uh, uh, I mean uh, I would like to that we talk more about social reality in the same way as we talk about virtual reality or uh, artificial reality, right? So there's artificial reality, virtual reality, and social reality. Okay. Uh, so, so, and uh, in this lecture, I'm going to uh, speak about uh, social reality, which is, uh, in my view, uh, a corporate hybrid between handheld media and the psychic structure of the user, right? And they have fused. They have become one and the same. It's a distributed form of social ranking that can no longer be reduced to the interests merely of state and corporate platforms. And so what I'm saying is uh, uh, the users are not merely victims. Of course we can define them as victims uh, of, uh, of the corporate agenda. We can use, uh, define the user as a victim uh, of state surveillance and so on and so on, right? But I don't think uh, uh, we, uh, we, we, will get, uh, uh, we will get anywhere soon, uh, you know, if we continue uh, with this kind of victimization uh, of each other. As online subjects, we are implicit, far too deeply involved, right? So the, uh, and, and this is important, the, the user is not just a victim. The, u the constitutive nature of the user is one who is actively participating, right? And the whole architecture of the social media is designed for active participation. Active participation is the default. Without active participation, there's nothing. Yes? And this is also the radical different uh, uh, situation in comparison to, let's say, e even television or <laughs> reading the newspaper, right? Uh, people sometimes compare them, but it's, it's not really uh, of much use. If, if you are not participating, uh, then, um, you know, the, the, there's nothing happening. There's nothing happening. You, you need to give, feed the machine constantly, right? And the feeding of the machine is not just a byproduct or something that's happening in secret in the background. No, the feeding of the machine is the constitutional act. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is an important... Um, uh, social reality works in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. It's all about you and your profile. Likes and followers define your social status. 
But what happens when nothing can motivate you anymore? Eh? And this is the flip side. We, are, we start to see it comes in. What happens when all the self-optimization techniques fail and you begin to carefully avoid these um, forms of emo emotional analytics? Compared to others, your ranking is low. And this makes you sad. So this this is kind of uh, the uh, here you can uh, see what happened what starts to happen right it's not all just a kind of an optimization of um, um, of se of se self um, self optimization uh, techniques right because they they often fail of course. Sadness already existed before social media, and even when the smartphone is safely out of reach, you can still feel down and out. Let's step out of the determinist merry-go-round that all too quickly spins from capitalist alienation and disastrous states of mind to blaming Silicon Valley for your misery. Even technological sadness is a style about a cold one. The sorrow, no matter how short, is real. This is what happens when we can no longer distinguish between telephone and society. If we can't freely change our profile and feel too weak to delete the app, we're condemned to feverishly check for updates during the brief in-between moments of our busy lives. In a split second, the real-time machine has teleported us out of our current situation and onto another playing field filled with many reports we quickly have to investigate. Uh, and we know very well, um, probably all of us know that um, this, this, the social media accompany us in our busy lives, right? And there's always a, lost, a very small lost moment where we can uh, uh, quickly check uh, what's, uh, what's going on uh, elsewhere. Omnipresent social media... I'm trying to see if it comes up, but I don't understand why. It just does not want to hmm? start. Come on. Is any, anyone has an idea here what's going on? <laughs> Why my machine is completely and utterly failing. <laughs> uh, Maybe it is already open. Yeah, um, it could be, but then we should. No, it says not responding. Okay, yeah. Okay. All right, ignore. No, don't do that. <laughs> I'm not interested in that. Maybe you could try opening it. Yeah, yeah, maybe if do the other way around, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's see if that works. Mm. Yeah, that's what happens when you have an old machine and I don't want to say goodbye to my old machine, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, um, so omnipresent social media places a claim on our elapsed time, our fractured life. We're all sad in our very own way. There's, uh, there are no lulls or quiet moments anymore. The result is fatigue, depletion and loss of energy. We're becoming obsessed with waiting. Uh, and the waiting and the social media, they're really closely connected. On the social media, we have to wait for the others to respond. Uh, and uh, while we are waiting, we go to the social media to see if we can uh, get uh, an update from the other. How long? Have you been forgotten by your loved ones? Time, meticulously measured on every app, 
tell us right to our face. Kronos hurts. Should I post something to attract attention and show I'm still there? Nobody likes me anymore. As the random messages keep relentlessly piling in, there's no way to hold them, to take a moment and think it all through. Delacroix once declared that every day which is not noted is like a day that does not exist. Diary writing used to fulfill that task. Elements of early blog cultures try to update the diary form for the online realm. Maybe you remember the blog, the, the, di the online diary, that kind of stuff. Uh, but that moment has now passed, right? The, the social media are just too fast for diary writing, right? The, di the, the diary is very short, um, uh, and um, of course it exists uh, um, on, um, uh, on Instagram, but then it, 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 it had the Instagram stories, uh, it, they are there, but then uh, they, uh, they disappear, right? So you, you, all, you all know that. Unlike the blog entries of the Web 2.0 era, social media have surpassed the summary state of the diary. Eh? The, the diary forces you to kind of reflect on the day and, yep, yeah, okay. Uh, that, that kind of moment of reflection uh, is simply not, not there anymore in the relentless space of the 24-7 uh, um, yeah, you kind of, uh, the, yeah, all right, well, look at this, okay, there we are, hmm? now let's see if it's gonna work, okay, sorry about that, took me a while, but here we are, um, Instagram stories, for example, bring back the nostalgia of an unfolding chain of events and then disappear at the end of the day. Like a revenge act. A satire of ancient sentiments gone by. Storage will make the pain permanent. Better to uh, forget about it and move on. And uh, I think one of the really interesting elements of the social media is precisely uh, that it, it kind of officially claims that there is storage, but we all know from experience that we can hardly store anything, right? There's so much uh, uh, happening and there's so much passing by that it, it almost becomes impossible uh, to store. I, I'm really interested if any of the artists you know, are, are, are attempting to, to store what's happening. Uh, it's almost impossible. It's impossible to find to search, right? To go back, uh, can you rem uh, imagine that you would go back into the into your Facebook of one and a half years or two? Years? They try. They they they've e even developed it as a function, right? Uh, you one year ago you did this or that, huh? but that's precisely because you've forgotten it, right? So Facebook has then already incorporated this kind of a gesture, like okay, you you. You cannot possibly remember everything, so let let us at least uh, you know help you out uh, with uh, with this. So that's that's uh, uh, interesting, and that's that's the price we pay of uh, you know complex uh, social uh, communication on a 24/7 uh, basis. It's easy to contrast the relentless swing between phone and life with the way anthropologists describe metamorphosis. And so the metamorphosis is the possibility to change, to become something else. In initiation and ritual are slow events that require time, instigated by periods of voluntary solitude. The perpetual now that defines the smart condition is anything but an endurance test. By browsing through the updates, we're catching up with machine time. At least until we collapse under the weight of participation fatigue. Organic life cycles are short-circuited and accelerated up to a point 
where the personal life of billions have finally caught up with cybernetics. In the online context, sadness appears as a short moment of indecisiveness, a flash that opens up the possibility of a reflection. Uh, so for me, sadness is the possibility of reflection. It's not reflection itself, but at least you still experience some kind of a moment of a, a possibility where you, you have to stop and think, what the hell is going on? What is the other doing? Why am I uh, getting so upset? Or uh, why is the other not responding? Or uh, we all know these daily anxieties right or you get really uh, angry um, for that matter um, uh, and uh, there's a whole debate uh, between the the female let's say response to the social media in the form of sadness and then the the male uh, response in the form of uh, of anger of uh, of uh, trolling or uh, um, uh, aggression right mm? I'm in this essay, I'm not uh, uh, buying into that uh, classic uh, gender division, but there's a lot to be said about this. But we could also discuss it in, in the form of, a, let's say, a feminization of uh, everyday life, of digital everyday life, right? So where the question is not, oh, are only women sad and, uh, and the men are mad, or something like that. Uh, uh, it doesn't really um, make much sense. Uh, also because a, a lot of research shows that uh, the behavioral science uh, that is based on all this uh, is developed and implemented by males targeting, targeting females. Uh, so this is already uh, an interesting uh, aspect of it. Uh, so a lot of this research and the software uh, is developed by men for 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 women uh, um, and so so and, and um, so if you read the uh, let's say the literature that comes out now the the programmers of Facebook and Google that uh, you know step up and uh, leave the companies and and come up with all these confessions uh, there's always uh, uh, this uh, this element uh, in there which I I think is very uh, interesting sadness um, in the online context, sadness appears as a possibility of a reflection. I said that. Frequently used, a sad label is a vehicle, a strange attractor to enter the liquid mass called social media. Sadness is a container. Each and every situation can be qualified as sad. Right? This cup can, is in fact very sad. I don't know if you uh, notice it, but uh, so ev every object uh, can can be become really sad, right? Um, not to mention, uh, of course, this uh, uh, plastic uh, water bottle, um, uh, because they they embody the the kind of. Um, um, tragic uh, everyday life uh, that we feel tra trapped, right? So the social media uh, reflect that feeling that that we are uh, trapped and and that there's no way no way out. We can't leave the social media, but um, f it becomes a symbol of the everyday life that we cannot uh, uh, escape. Through this mild form of suffering. We enter the blues of being in the world. Uh, so for me, sadness is not a disease. Uh, and it's um, uh, so it, it's not. Uh, I, I describe it as a very mild form, uh, very comparable to boredom. Uh, I want to write something about boredom, also about loneliness. They're kind of connected, but the sadness. Um, uh, is uh, is comparable to this so it's a mild form very thin but widely spread right so it's it's everybody is uh, confronted with it somehow but it doesn't mean we suffer from it uh, in a in a yeah medical way when something is sad things around it become gray you trust the machine because 
you feel you're in control of it you want to go from zero to hero but then the propped up ego implodes and the failure of self-esteem becomes apparent again and so it's got these constant ups and downs of of moods the price of self-control in an age of instant gratification is high we long to revolt against the re restless zombie inside us but we don't know how our psychic armor is thin and eroded from within open to behavioral modifications and here i i kind of refer to yeah the psychoanalytic uh, theories of especially of 70s right well we, we that deal with uh, the question of the psychic armor hmm? and uh, and I think that uh, the behavioral science developed in uh, Facebook and Google has precisely studied uh, that and have, have found out uh, ways uh, to enter something very deep uh, inside us, which makes us go back to it so often, 20, 50, 100 times a day, um, which is very normal uh, for each and every of us uh, to, to do, right? Um, and this, in my view, comes is because they found the holes in this very thin psychic armor. Sadness arises at the point we're exhausted by the online world after yet another app session in which we failed to make a date through Tinder, purchased a ticket online, and did a quick round of online videos on YouTube. The post dopamine mood hits us hard the sheer busyness and self-importance of the world makes you feel joyless after a dive into the network we're drained and feel socially awkward the swiping finger is tired and we have to stop sadness expresses the growing gap between the self-image of a perceived social status and the actual precarious reality. The temporary dip described here under the codename sadness can be best understood as a mirror phenomena of the pervasive um, of the self-promotion machine that constructs the links for us. The mental state is so pervasive the merging of social media with the self so totalizing that we see uh, that we see this, this the sadness as a manifestation of an anti-self that we slip into and then walk away from and so it's kind of the, the I use so the, the, uh, there's a connection between the anti-self and the sadness right uh, because the self needs to be constantly on stage has to perform, respond, uh, make a selfie, and so on and so on. It's considered sad when most of your friends are bots. The conservative judgment that many friends indicate a lack of character and gestalt fails short here, as most are mach machine-generated social relationships anyway, right? So our re relationships become so machine-generated. And I think this is important. As buying um, followers has become more acceptable, social status no longer has to be built from the ground up through hard online labor. And we see especially young people being very good at that. And this is in fact how you can uh, become an influencer. Huh? And so th this is kind of, uh, th that's no secret how that uh, happens. You can just uh, you, you can start, let's say, your your business with ten or fifty thousand followers, right? That's that's normal. We should be careful to distinguish sadness from anomalies such as suicide, depression, and burnout. Everything and everyone can be called sad, but not everyone is depressed. Much like boredom, sadness is not a medical condition. No matter how brief and mild, sadness is the default state of the online billions. Its uh, original uh, intensity um, 
gets dissipated. It seeps out, becoming a general atmosphere, a chronic background condition. Occasionally, for, the, for a brief moment, we feel the loss. And so the sadness is not something you uh, feel all the time, but it's there. Especially uh, when, the, uh, when the others are uh, not online, uh, you have to wait. Uh, and the, 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 then uh, it hits you hard. A seething rage, rage emerges. After checking for the tenth time what somebody said on Instagram, the pain of the social makes us feel miserable and we put the phone away. And you know the gesture. Everyone knows the gesture. Put the phone away, right? Because mm? you had enough. You can't bear it anymore. Am I suffering from the phantom vibration symptom? Wouldn't it be nice if we were offline? Why is life so tragic? He blocked me. At night, you read through the thread again. Do we need to quit again to go cold turkey again? Others are supposed to move us, to arouse us, and yet we don't feel anything anymore. The heart is frozen. Once the excitement wears off, we seek distance, searching for mental detachment. The wish for anti-experience arises, as Mark Grave has described it. The reduction of feeling is an essential part of what Mark Grave calls the anesthetic ideology. If experience is the habit of creating isolated moments within raw occurrence in order to save and recount them, as he says it, the desire to anesthetize experience is a kind of immune response against the stimulations of yet another modern novelty, the total aesthetic environment. Much of our time the eyes are glued on the screen, as if it's now or never. As Gloria Estefan wrote, the sad, true, the sad truth is that opportunity doesn't knock twice, right? And this idea is very uh, prevalent. I think we, we are so obsessed with the social media because we know that uh, it's not going to repeat itself, right? Things might occur, and, and if we miss out, uh, then uh, a, a crucial connection cannot be made, a crucial uh, message cannot be sent. Um, and this is, we feel this is important, so important that we need to be there, in fact, uh, all the time. Then you stand up and walk away from the intrusions. The fear of missing out backfires. The social battery is empty and you put, once again, the phone aside. This is the moment sadness arises. It's been all too much. The intake has been pulverized and you shut down for a moment, poisoning him with your unanswered messages, right? So the unanswered message is also a very, very important uh, ingredient. The act of not answering eh, is becoming more and more important and uh, is becoming more and more visible. So the act of not doing something is becoming more and more visible, hmm? which is strange. It's a very uh, contemporary uh, condition, a contemporary paradox, let's say. According to Mark Grive, the hallmark of the conversation of anti-experience is lowered threshold for eventfulness. And there is something also, I find something interesting. A Facebook event is the one you're interested in, but do not attend. And so this is, a, uh, uh, and so there is, there is, there is that uh, ambivalent, uh, yes, you want to attend, uh, but you don't, and um, but you express your uh, interest, um, and th this is kind of what uh, Mark Greif calls uh, the um, the anti uh, event, right? Because in the in the end, 
uh, you don't go and um, you you experience in a way the uh, not the event itself but the anti-event. The nature um, there are nature's uh, creatures in in the full grace of maternity. The sad truth is you will want to live in their world. It's just somehow seems this world has changed to exile you, eh? so you feel excluded, you don't want to be part of that event, you leave the online arena just to rest, eh? you don't go. Uh, this is an inverse moment from the constant quest uh, for experience, that is, until we turn our heads away, grab the phone, swipe and text back. God only knows what I'd be without the app. Okay, thank you very much. I'll leave it uh, here and um, we can now uh, uh, go to the next part in which we discuss all this. Thank you very much. Hmm?